everybody. My name is Leah Gropo. I'm one of the dietitians and diabetes educators at Stanford Healthcare. Today, I want to talk about pre-diabetes. Um, so this is a topic that people have a lot of questions around. So hopefully over this presentation, we can maybe demystify some of the, those things. And my main goal is that you leave this talk thinking I can do something about my health if I'm diagnosed with prediabetes. So I wanna talk really about what's going on inside of our bodies. And then since I'm a dietitian, really focusing on food and exercise and things that we can really do that are evidence-based to reduce our blood sugar numbers. So what are our risk factors around blood sugar? So we have ones that are non-modifiable, which we cannot change, we're born with, we have no control over, so I don't really spend that much time over them. Um, and then we have modifiable risk factors. So those are the things that are in our control, things that we can maybe make changes around. I know some people mention stress is hard to change, but um, we do. there are strategies to kind of help with that. So thinking about getting to a healthy weight, if that's indicated, or re, um, reducing our weight maybe by 5 to 10%. Um, thinking about what foods we put in our bodies and nourish our bodies with, how we exercise and move our bodies. Um, and then also thinking about managing stress and reducing stress, because that can raise our blood sugar, how our sleep is, and then how some of our other labs are, for example, cholesterol. What are the numbers? So the numbers around uh, prediabetes and blood sugar are less than 100 or less than 5.7 for a hemoglobin A1C or a 90-day average of blood sugar is in kind of that tar target range. Prediabetes starts at 100 fasting to 125 um, is that prediabetes range, and the A1C is 5.7 to 6.4. And then if you're diagnosed with diabetes, that would be 126 and above or 6.5 and above. Typically, your provider will be looking for two labs that are in that diabetic range before having a diabetes diagnosis, but that's something you would definitely check with, with them. What helps? I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, five to 10 percent weight loss can be helpful if indicated. If you feel like weight loss is not indicated, thinking about building up those muscles can really be helpful for blood sugar as well. Reducing processed food intake, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, and then getting movement into our day. So moving as much as possible. And so our goal is one 150 minutes per week or 30 minutes five days a week. However, if that's something that feels unrealistic, thinking about five to 10 minutes walks after meals or before meals can be really helpful for blood sugars. Even things like gardening or taking the stairs at work can be very helpful insulin resistance. So I like to go over this slide because it's something that really is thought to be one of the core reasons behind prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Our bodies have an organ called a pancreas. The pancreas puts out insulin. Insulin is a hormone that helps us to let the glucose or sugar into the cells that need to um, have that for energy. For example, like a muscle cell. So without insulin, our body is not able to absorb and use that glucose where it needs to provide energy. Um, so in the top one, this is how um, we would like it to function. So it's attaching to the insulin receptor and letting glucose into that cell. The bottom one is an example of insulin resistance. So maybe the insulin that we're putting out is not as able to fit on that receptor. The receptor looks a little bit different or there's not as many receptors on those muscle cells. So glucose is not let into the cell and glucose can build up a little bit more. I like to think about this almost like insulin is a key that unlocks the door to let sugar or glucose into the cells where it's needed to function and be used. Another way to think about this is when our muscle cells need energy because we've been working them, our body is more sensitive to the insulin that we need and it actually mobilizes some of those receptors more to that cell membrane because it, it realizes it's lower on energy. It wants to replenish that. So that's another thing to think about why we always really think about ways to get more movement into our day. So going back to processed foods. So this is my sort of trying to be a little bit more simple explanation of what is a processed food. With this, we're thinking about processed carbohydrate foods. 
So if we look at this uh, piece in ear of corn, we know that is an ear of corn. We can say, hey, that's as close to mother nature made as possible. If we look down cornmeal, it's a little bit harder to tell that's corn based, corn flakes even harder. And then high fructose corn syrup, it's really the hardest to identify what that is. And so when we're thinking about processed foods, we want to eat them and visually be able to see them be as close to mother nature made them as possible because the further down we go with processing, the more the food companies have done the digestion and breakdown for us. So our bodies don't need to do that work. And we actually want to make our bodies work a little bit harder for those foods, um, like they're meant and set up to do. Here are some healthy substitutions that another dietitian, Amy Reisenberg, and I have created. Um, so thinking about if you're used to eating white rice or white bread or pasta, here are kind of some other substitutions that amp up the fiber and can really kind of slow down blood sugar. Um, thinking about added spurs, focusing on fresh fruits, because if we have a whole piece of fruit that has fiber, lots of nutrition in it, as well as the sugar, it's not just straight sugar, so closer to mother nature made it as possible. And then also thinking about proteins, leaner proteins, or even plant-based proteins, experimenting with those. Um, oils, we want to think about ones that are liquid at room temperature, maybe not in um, really cold weather. Some of those oils may get a little bit more viscous, but really we want to think about them pourable at room temperature. And then snacks, thinking about if we always throw in a bag of cookies into our lunch bag, thinking about maybe a nut-based um, bar or a handful of nuts or um, something like that to kind of mix it up. It doesn't say it does, doesn't mean that you can't have things like cookies or pastries, but if it's kind of the default that we're throwing into our bag, we're kind of going to consume them more um, versus trying to make the default maybe even a bag of carrots or something like that. So thinking about nutrient timing, does it make a difference? Um, this is a study that I found to be really helpful to kind of just reframe some suggestions that I may make to people I work with. So this study basically had people living with type 2 diabetes on metformin, which is a medication, come in and they gave them something that um, was higher glycemic, so bread and juice. They waited 10 minutes and then they had salad and protein. Then they flipped it around. They had salad and protein and then had that same portion of juice and bread. And then the final time they came in for that visit, they had it as a mixed meal. And so as a dietitian, I would always think that green or mixed meal one would have the lowest blood sugar effect and spike. Um, but what they really found was that that middle one, so the protein and the salad in up front really had kind of that um, lower blood sugar spike. I will say by adding the juice, I think that that green example um, really trended a little bit closer with that yellow line. But I believe if we took out that juice, um, we would have seen a nicer curve in the middle is my prediction, but doesn't have the evidence to back it up. What really this shows is that maybe we're going out to a larger meal. Maybe we want to have a side salad instead of the bread before we have our pasta dish. It doesn't mean that we have to forgo that dish if we're going out, but we want to just maybe be um, choice architecture um, and create that salad first and see what our, happens to our blood sugar. So thinking about activity, so when we are more active, our glucose can be lower for up to 24 hours. So we really can mobilize more of those receptor sites to our muscles and the muscles are asking for more sugar. So even if we're active and we feel like, oh, it's just for a short while, it can have really large waves and residual benefit later. Um, thinking about really increasing that sensitivity to insulin um, and really utilizing what you already have. And then finally, I just want to end with thinking about trying to create a SMART goal. So some type of goal around change, something that is um, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound, something that you really feel like you can do. You're that definitely the expert in your own life. And so thinking about, could I add a 10-minute walk um, after breakfast? Could I think about walking my dog maybe one more block? Or could I think about trying some of those uh, grain-based recommendations or uh, suggestions, substitutions? Doesn't mean that has to happen all the time, but it's just thinking about some examples. 
Um, I just want to really also thank you so much for spending the time with me um, while I chatted about prediabetes. Hopefully it was a helpful talk that you can think about some new ways to look at the ways that you are active and the ways that you um, consume your food. So without further ado, bye.